As I mentioned the other day, there's a passage in the suttas where the Buddha compares the Eightfold Path to a chariot and the different factors of the path are like different parts of a chariot. And a lot of the comparisons don't mean much to us because we don't know much about chariots. We're not familiar with them. But there are some ways in which chariots are like cars or trucks. And some of the parts of the chariots are like parts of a car or a truck. And there the comparisons are really interesting. As I noted then, mindfulness is the driver watching over things, directing the chariot in the right direction. Another interesting comparison is the horses, which can be compared to the engines of a car. And there are two of them. One is conviction, the other is discernment. These are the things that pull your practice along. It's easy to see how conviction would play that role. Belief that the teachings are true, that pulls you to practice. It's interesting that discernment is also pulling you to practice. It's the power that gets the whole thing going. In other words, you think about what the Buddha said about right view. That it is possible to put an end to suffering. And there's a path that you can follow, and he lays it out. So those are not just interesting facts, like the moons of Jupiter, or the structure of an atom. Those are facts you can do something with, and they contain an imperative. Remember, the Four Noble Truths don't just sit there, they have duties. The duty, if you really want to put an end to suffering, with regard to suffering itself, is to comprehend it, to see how the desire and passion of clinging, focused on the aggregates, is what actually constitutes suffering. You want to comprehend that, because most of the times when we're suffering, we're not thinking in terms of, gee, I'm clinging to my aggregates. You're thinking about, why am I suffering? Why is that person doing some, that to me? Why are these conditions of the world like this? And even if we are upset about the conditions of the world, and they are pretty upsetting, our suffering has nothing to do with them. It has all to, to do with our clinging to aggregates. So you want to see that. You want to comprehend how that's the case. Then there's the cause of suffering, the origination of suffering. The word origination doesn't mean just cause, it means the cause coming from within the mind. And that's to be abandoned. Here again, it's desire and passion in the role of craving. Craving for sensuality, your fascination with sensual thoughts, sensual fantasies. Craving for becoming. We need to take on an identity in a world of experience so you can get something that you want. And craving for non-becoming. Those times when you just would prefer to be obliterated. These things you want to abandon. And when you abandon them, that puts an end to suffering. You want to realize that. And you realize it by developing the path. So discernment basically tells us not that this is this and that is that, which a lot of times it seems to be, especially when you get into the Abhidhamma, it's all about identifying different mind states and being able to label things correctly. It's more of the Buddhist saying with the Four Noble Truths. Here you're suffering, but you don't have to. There's something better, and you can do better. That's what pulls you along as you practice. Without that, the practice just sits there. You've got a chariot, but it doesn't go anywhere. But you have a sense that 
yes, things can be better, and I can make myself better, and I can do better. That's what discernment tells you. And then your conviction puts more oomph into that. Not only is there a better way to act, but you feel, yes, I can do this. I have it within me. And it's worth putting out that effort. Those are the things that drive your practice along. We see the active side of discernment in lots of different places, in right resolve. After you've gotten a good sense of right view, you have the resolve that, well, I want to do the things that will put an end to suffering. So it's, instead of resolving on sensuality, you resolve on renunciation. Renunciation doesn't mean just giving up. It means making a trade. You're going to find a, a happiness that doesn't have to depend on sensuality. That's what we're doing as we meditate. I was reading a while back, someone complaining that the idea that we're going to get a sense of pleasure out of concentration, you have to be very careful because if it gets too strong, you're going to get attached. And they said that the, the pleasure of concentration comes from tactile sensation. Well, the pleasure of concentration is not a sensu sensual thing. It has to do with the form of the body as you feel it from within. It's a higher form of pleasure. And it's not intoxicating like sensual pleasures. It can be very addictive. And as John Fung said, it's good. Get crazy about your meditation. Get really stuck on your meditation. Because it's only when you're really into it that it can take you someplace. And then, then you can pry yourself loose. But if you're afraid to really get into it, really enjoy it, you're never going to go anywhere to resolve on finding your happiness in, renounce, in renouncing sensuality and exploring this sense of well-being that you can develop here inside the body, starting with the way you breathe. Then to resolve on what the Buddha says is non-ill will, which can mean everything from goodwill to equanimity. And then you resolve on harmlessness, which is basically resolving on compassion. So you've got all the Brahmaviharas. So basically you're setting yourself up for right concentration. You realize that if you really want to put it into suffering, this is where you've got to do it, getting the mind in concentration, in that image of the the chariot, concentration is the, the axle around which the wheels of right effort revolve. So discernment does have its active, active aspect. It's pulling you someplace. Right view tries to shake you up and say, hey, the way you've been living your life is not satisfactory. There's a lot better, and you can do better. And when you adopt that, your conviction and through your own discernment as you develop, as you practice, you can pull yourself in a much better direction. And John Sua tells the story of when he was with John Fun. There was one day they were in the sala, and this one woman who lived in a village nearby, came and she just complained about how poor she was. I'm just a poor person, and over and over and over again. And John Fun said, well, you don't have to be. There are things you can do to pull yourself out. No, I'm just a poor person. And as John Sway pointed out, well, he'd been born a poor person too, but he didn't stay that way. This gives you a sense of what the forest tradition meant for the people of the Northeast, that they could make something better out of themselves. Think about it, John Lee, orphaned in an early age, wants to ordain, wants to get a little bit of merit, gets distressed to see that the 
monastery where he's living doesn't really abide, abide by the vinaya. And when a monk, a forest monk, comes through, he immediately latches on to this op opportunity. This is what the Dharma means. There's something better, and here's the opening. So let that thought pull you along. You can do better. And it will be better when you do better. In other words, it's worth the effort that goes into it. The results will be good. That's what drives our practice, what gives power to the practice. So that when your concentration is not good, you don't just say, well, I guess this is a bit as good as it can be. I can learn how to accept it and not get more worked up about it. You tell yourself, there must be something better, I must be missing something. And usually it's so obvious, once you see it, that you would be embarrassed not to try to see it. Let that thought pull you along. When you get stuck on concentration, and there's a lazy part of the mind that says, well, this is good enough, I might as well just hang out here. Right view is there to tell you, no, there's something better. But this is why those perceptions of inconstancy, stress, and not self work. Because they basically say, this is not worth hanging on to, what you've got here. It's got all these drawbacks. And if you don't believe that there is a third noble truth, i.e., the cessation of suffering, absolute cessation of suffering, you tell yourself, well, there's nothing better than what I've got right now, so I might as well just accept it. Then those perceptions don't work. But if you have that concept that, yes, there is an end to suffering, and it's because I'm hanging on to these things when I don't have to, how can I find a way not to hang on? That thought drives you along. So let conviction and discernment be your powertrain to make sure their practice keeps getting better and better all the time.